Welcome to today's webinar on unlocking the value of data in mining and operations with Power BI. Uh, my name is Dougal McBurney. I am the CEO of Versal. When of, we're one of Australia's uh, leading data analytics and AI specialists. And I certainly want to thank you all for making time in your diary to hear today's story, which uh, is a fantastic um, insight really from the team at uh, Newcrest Mining about how they've gone unlocking that value of data and the value of the single source of truth. Uh, in addition to the Newcrest team, um, I'll talk a bit about the uh, tr industry trends that are um, that people should be aware of in data and analytics that are really kind of transforming how businesses drive value from this. And Chris Benson, who is uh, the Director of Data Analytics and AI uh, for Versal, will also then talk about uh, kind of the technical best practices about how do you make sure that your foundations are in place to really make sure, ensure you scale you know, these solutions? So, um, yeah, look, I think from the trends pers perspective, uh, Leah, Leanne, if you can just make that uh, slide live and just tell me when it's live. Okay, fantastic. So, look, there's obviously a lot happening in the market, as we're all aware. Um, the key really trends I want to talk about today is the the pace of adoption of data analytics and AI and really the shift in the last kind of couple of years especially. Um, obviously IoT is um, still a, a mega trend that's transforming pretty much every industry so we'll unpack that a bit and then I think it's about talking to you know who are the leading organizations, who are the people and the companies that are actually embracing this and leading the pack and, and creating enormous value from it. And then I think it's understanding about what are the attributes, kind of what's their secret source that has enabled them to do that and achieve that and then kind of wrap it up. So let's talk a bit about accelerated data and analytics and AI adoption. Um, yeah, this is a chart from uh, McKinsey.com and you know what their analysis has shown is that you know the global pandemic has fundamentally shifted the pace of adoption of digital technologies by up to 10 times within an 18 month period. So if we look at the uh, Asia Pac chart here, you know, you've got, you know, June 17, you've got it kind of a level of 31, you know, tapering off slightly in 18, ramping up slightly in 19, but broadly kind of not changing, you know, materially and then literally within 18 months, you know, kind of increasing all the way up through 54. And this is, you know, consistent, you know, whether it's six years, seven years, you know, seven or 10 globally, you know, you've got uh, the pandemic has created this sense of urgency inside organizations to rapidly digitize. So all of the barriers around adoption that people were experiencing were really obliterated overnight. And you can see the scale. You know, what that means is that, you know, for a lot of organizations that are accelerating, they're creating a much larger gap faster between them and their competitors because not only they've embraced it, but they're embedding it, they're changing the ways that they're working to use data analytics and AI in everyday life. And, you know, when you see the impact of that in market, like a promotional, a highly focused kind of promotional activity from a retailer, as an example, what you're seeing is probably 18 months worth of work and all the foundations to get there. And so, you know, now there's an impetus across the broader market to kind of catch up if they haven't necessarily embraced it. And I think you're seeing, that's why you're seeing overall this massive acceleration. Look, I think the second trend that we're all, you know, really aware of is just the scale of growth of um, IoT devices. You know, it's talking about, you know, sort of, 7 billion devices in 19 all the way up to 25 you know, billion in 2030. So sort of 300% growth, you know, literally planned over this, this decade that we're in. And from a spend side, you know, from a, a lazy 465 billion to, you know, 1.5 trillion by 2030. And, you know, that rate of change has been actually, and the pace of adoption has been really consistent within the IoT world. And it's because, every industry is actually seeing the tangible value that this, the IoT devices are creating for their businesses. These are real business use cases. No one's going to invest, you know, hundreds of billions and trillions of dollars if there's no value. So 
these are value-driven use cases. And, and I say, whether it's a water utility that's implementing, you know, 10, 20, 100,000 you know, IoT sensors so that they can manage the flow of water and minimise leakage, whether it's mining operations like the, the team at Newcrest might talk about today, where they've got, you know, hundreds of thousands of sensors on, you know, trucks and equipment about preventative maintenance, whether it's, you know, rail corporations that have got them on their tracks, whether it's energy providers. People are using this the sensors to collect data to integrate into advanced platforms to run algorithms to, you know, provide you know, greater value out of the assets that they've got and make better investments of it. Then I think this is going to continue. And that really strong fabric of IoT kind of capability is paramount for that next generation, which is all about digital twins that we might cover in another presentation down the track. So I think the question is who's leading the pack? Um, and there's lots of people, but you know, we sort of would like to shine the light on a couple. You know, certainly, uh, Newcrest Mining that are talking today, and this is publicly available information. You know, they've they've bet on AI and IoT to monitor mines, and you can see a quote there from you know Gavin Wood. It's fundamentally about using machine learning and IoT to create automation and proactive kind of management of the mines to make them safer and more productive. And this is a consistent story across industry. You're talking about Blue Scope that are investing in an advanced analytics and AI platform that we're working with them on and they're transitioning 800 models to the kind of whole cloud ecosystem. You know, you've got Barrick there where they're actually kind of, you know, enabling kind of citizen um, data scientists with their engineering community. Uh, you've got Procter and Gamble that you can see with, you know, sensors in toothbrushes to actually kind of optimize how you brush your teeth and, you know, smart nappies and diapers down in that bottom right hand corner. And if you look at Procter and Gamble, you know, 35% kind of, you know, increase in a quarter based on the digital digital experiences. And, and there again, you know, they're in that curve, you know, we've been investing heavily in that space for some time and now they're really driving the value out of it rather than chasing, they're leading the pack. And in the top right hand corner, you can see, you know, Shell is an example that's a, this is a link from the Databricks website where they're using IoT and Databricks and AI, you know, to, save millions of dollars there in you know engine repair costs and you know processing data in kind of nine times faster and, and there's a local example where we've built a model for a, a large energy retailer that's um, on our website where we transform their ability to forecast from literally at a high level within 24 hours now down to a micro level within an hour and and that's what these platforms are doing and that's what these leaders are doing they're embracing the technology but really importantly, they're changing the ways that they are working so that they can use and embed and use that technology and the and the data and the around it to make those better decisions. Technology without the adoption piece is a real issue in any of these investments. So what are the sort of successful kind of attributes of these companies? You know, and I just thought there were there were four key ones that I thought we should talk about. You know, you, you can't you can't enable the sorts of outcomes that these organizations are doing without a secure, scalable and adaptable enterprise grade data analytics and AI platform. It is absolutely table stakes and you need it in place. Then we'll go through that in detail and what that means. Equally of importance is the business owner ownership for the investments. This is business led change. This is business case led change. The, the ownership of it let, rests with the business and the tech functions in a cross-functional manner kind of play the role to bring it to life because ultimately the business is accountable for safety and for profitability and for productivity you know so they need to they need to embrace it um, to then own it new ways of working again you can't continue the way we have been working in the same sort of siloed structures you know and try to take full advantage of this technology so there's a shift there as well so if we think about what is an enterprise grade data analytics platform? You know, there's a couple of things here that are important and have evolved. You not only need something that has a core capability in the cloud, but you also need a platform and an architecture that can scale to the edge, all right? Because in a lot of businesses, it's sometimes right to the edge of the computing environment in a, in a remote site, you know, at a remote kind of LNG gas plant, et cetera. So you do need that core to edge. I mean, one of the benefits of these platforms, you need it to be highly secure 
uh, with really fine grained auditing so you know exactly what is happening within that environment. Um, the scale of the devices that we're talking about and the volume of data that is consumed in these platforms, unless you have a platform that's architectured to be dynamically scalable and responsive, there'll be material issues in your ability to drive value from it. Um, I think the benefit of the cloud is uh, the use of accelerators to move quickly. So again, these are smaller teams, you know, fast starts compared to kind of larger teams and very slow running projects going back kind of, you know, three, five years ago. Um, and, you know, Brad and, and Martin from Newcrest today will talk about the, the criticality of single source of truth for data. You know, it is an absolute must. This is what these platforms kind of really enable and they enable then the sort of seamless access. Um, that fully automated and microbatch code release, you know, this is something that software engineering has been doing for a fair while, and now it's fully available and embedded into data ops. And so your ability to have constant releases of capability into the business rather than waiting days and weeks and, you know, for that actual months to be able to be in the, you know, release window, that, that mindset has to change, okay? Because the business can't, your business owners can't wait two weeks for a piece of capability. They need it today to make decisions tomorrow. And I think that that's that velocity of business and that this enables us to achieve. And then the architecture about loosely coupled to integrate new capabilities because, you know, the innovation in the cloud is, is it is it really um, lightning speed and you need to have an architecture that enables you to kind of tap into those new capabilities at any point in time. Um, the business ownership, look, you just can't talk about this enough. You know, as I said, you know, the businesses own the benefits of the investments and they have the responsibility operationally of changing the ways they're working to get the most out of those investments. And without that strong ownership and sponsorship, the readiness won't be there and effectively we'll have a Ferrari that's stuck in the garage. And now, I don't know about you, but if we had something like that, we'd want to get out on the road in fifth gear all the time, right? People want to make the most value out of the investments that they're making. And I think that you'll find that there's ongoing investment baked into the business case for this constant improvement. Again, gone are the days where we land a big piece of capability and then we let it sit for six months. No, what we're trying to do is land an MVP capability, you know, minimum viable product, and continually enhance it based on feedback from our business and our business owners, you know, of what they need. Because, you know, the sooner they get their hands on these platforms and capabilities, the sooner they experience it and the better informed they are to refine it. And that will maximise your, your best, certainly maximise the value you can generate it. Don't forget about change management. I know the team at Newcrest are going to talk about this absolutely fundamental you know how you embed new capability that people haven't used before is non-trivial and you need to consider it and make sure you invest in it um, new ways of working we talked a bit about this you know it's just a, an infinity loop and it's a continuous process right and i think that you know by getting with you know a lot of organizations have moved into agile practices they would have seen this time and time again this is about saying we are going to continually invest a certain amount of money in this environment and then focus on prioritizing the work that makes the most difference and get the cadence and high velocity. And what we have seen is um, organizations that have embraced this method have actually increased their engineering output because of all of the platform advances that they've got with code, micro code releases, code as infrastructure as code and automation. I think the other thing is, um, you know, the criticality of these projects is to have cross-functional teams and working in a cross-functional nature as a, as a squad and, and people on the, the webinar today would, would know that terminology. But it is about a collection of people with multiple skills from diverse parts of the organisation coming together and solving problems in a particular domain that are prioritised by the business owner, the product owner. This is unbelievably powerful. You know, once this team kind of forms and bonds and you get some cadence around them, you know, the output the, and the value generated from this model is extraordinary. And we've seen it kind of firsthand. I mean, some people then ask, well, how do you, you know, govern it? How do you have your standards? Well, you know, I think, you know, the evolution of this is that, that or the extension of it is that you have, 
you know, kind of center of excellences to support these squads. So a Power BI CRE as an example is about model, really advanced modeling and, and visualization expertise, supporting the squads as people come, and, come in and out of the squads as they, they improve their capability, making sure you've got the standards in the right area and data engineering and AI are exactly the same. But you can see it's this kind of hub and spoke, highly scalable model where the core sort of centers of excellence support all of the all of the hub of capability and depending on the maturity of that hub you know there's varying degrees of the level of support required and then they're constantly making sure the platform's evolving so they can drive more and more out of it and as i said you know the leading organizations the people that are driving that, that huge value from investments in data analytics and ai are people that are really have got this fully operational so as a Global pandemics accelerated the change. You know, obviously, ten times within eighteen months is is unbelievable. You know, the people that have embraced it are creating a large gap between them and their competitors. Um, you know, let's think about making sure you've got the right platforms in place, and you can do it a lot faster today than ever before. But fundamental success: let the business lead the investment. You know, and own it so that you've got this sustainable value creation. Right? It's not a one-off. This is a long-term kind of view of constantly releasing value and creating capability. And then, you know, you've got to think about the operating model and capability uplift in the business and making sure that you empower all the company to use the capability that's being established and whether that's Power BI, whether that's AI, whether that's just interacting with the data. So that's um, really what I want to run through today. Um, now I have the absolute pleasure to introduce uh, Martin Gallagher and Brad Robbins from Newcrest Mining. We've worked with Newcrest uh, over the last four years, helping them on their kind of Power BI journey. And I think everyone will find uh, today's presentation absolutely enlightening and exceptional. So I'll hand over to um, Martin and Brad. Okay, thanks, Dougal. That was a, that was a great intro. Um, as Dougal said, so my name's Martin Gallagher. I'm the manager for our digital platforms at Newcrest uh, and joined by Brad, who's our enterprise reporting lead. Uh, we're going to talk to you today, again, following on for some of the themes that Dougal mentioned, we'll talk a little bit about uh, our digital journey at Newcrest and then focus specifically on the creation of a number of um, data model assets covering our cost people production. Um, um, profiles across the organisation for better decision making. Just a little bit about Newcrest. Um, so we're one of the largest gold miners in the world, uh, ASX listed company with operating assets in Papua New Guinea, Australia and Canada and uh, exploration activities uh, across a range of locations across the globe, uh, primarily in the Americas currently. So before I get into it with um, uh, with Brad, I'm just going to take you through some of the key foundation steps that I think um, we put in place at Newcrest to help us unlock the value through data and then talk you through a little bit about how we're set up to connect our strategy to delivering the most important things to our sites. So we can just move on to the next slide, please. So I won't spend too long on this sli um, slide, but I think there are a couple of important messages here. So. Uh, we really started, uh, I guess, in in anger, so to speak, our journey back in 2014 um, and led by a, a very forward thinking and strong CIO in Gavin Wood. We had a very clear IT strategy that uh, was focused about around um, taking complexity out of our application portfolio. So the importance of this is just making sure that the, the data being captured in the organization um, is being done so um, so that you can actually do something with it um, once you've got the capabilities to do so. So not letting uh, the environment become complex and standardizing wherever possible. In parallel, taking some early moves to make sure that we did, uh, you know, uh, make our network optimized uh, as we could. Um, thinking about the future and where we were going to, um, you know, be transmitting large data sets um, uh, across our organization, particularly our bandwidth constrained remote operations. And then finally, um, having in place a set of sort of common sense policies and standards. I use that sort of term because 
not overbearing um, policies and standards, but uh, fit for purpose and equally understandable to guide our workforce as appropriate or partners within our workforce and partners in our, our, our industry workplace, the likes of um, Versa and, and Microsoft being two um, primary ones. So I'll just then move on to the next slide, please. So having these foundations in place is very important, but obviously then being able to connect what we do in the organisation to something that's meaningful and of value is critical. I think Dougal mentioned a couple of messages in that space. So we've used this slide a few times in the in the past, and it, it, it tends to um, tends to do the job. So from left to right, really what we're doing is connecting and collecting uh, huge amounts of data across obviously a mining operation. There's a, there's a huge amount of data collected, be that through mining and business applications. So things like our SAP app or our uh, metal accounting fleet management systems and, and the like, through to huge amounts of information captured through sensors and uh, instrumentation readings across our operational technology sets. So think conveyor belts, uh, crushing machinery, it, it mine sites uh, and um, information captured by the second um, on those pieces of equipment. And then more recently, we're starting to capture more information uh, around video and LIDAR imaging. Uh, and increasingly, as we roll out more and more uh, mobile capability into the organisation, there's new data sets um, that are being captured uh, as we um, digitise more and more of our operational processes. So huge amounts of data. So what we're doing in the digital platform space is translating that data into value using those foundations that were put in place. It sort of starts at that bottom layer there with our data platform. Uh, and I won't articulate it as well as Dougal did, but basically we're sort of uh, using big compute power up in the Azure cloud with the Microsoft product uh, and partners uh, such as Versa uh, utilising Microsoft services and edge based devices to basically combine that ability to grunt power with large data sets, but then delivering responsive and usable applications at our remote operations. And then what we're building across on top of that platform is a range of different data science and artificial intelligence uh, models. So predictive optimization and simulation type modeling. So the digital twins that Google referred to. And I'm not going to go into detail on this presentation on those items, but we, we have we have made some very significant successful products uh, in that space. And then where we will focus today is, is for our OneView team. So that's an internal brand name for OneView of looking at our data uh, across the organisation, be that through enterprise or increasingly putting that data in the hands of people that need it across our operations through Power BI. So then finally, I just wanted to, to um, get the point across that we have strong technology enablement squads. Again, the squad term that Dougal mentioned that are very well connected into our site strategies. So that what we're delivering and building again in, in an agile fashion is meeting the needs of the organization. And I think like Dougal said, I can't emphasize how important that part part is both to the delivery and to the adoption and post delivery. Uh, um, when we bring people in, we've brought people in who have strong operational experience to help run some of those teams. Um, and one of those individuals I'll hand over to uh, now is Brad, who has uh, over 23 years of experience in the organisation and has, has led our OneView team for the last 24 to 36 months. So I'll hand over to Brad now. Excellent. Thanks, Martin. Yeah, so as Martin suggests, I, I'm, I'm not an IT professional. Um, I come from a, from a, you know, predominantly a, a mining and maintenance asset management perspective, uh, background. I've uh, just been really fortunate to find myself in this position uh, to, to really lead a, a, a program of work that um, I think is really important in terms of uh, driving business performance, but, but also um, you know, it means a lot to the people in terms of it, it, it makes them more efficient and gives them some time back uh, as well. So, so this is, you know, the, our sort of headline slide about, um, you know, transforming Newcrest to a data driven business. There's a lot to it. Um, you know, there's not, you know, a, a single recipe to, to success with, with building this sort of um, transformation, I think, in, in, in any business. But, um, you know, why are we doing it? You know, predominantly, 
you know, we, we, we do drive uh, and we have um, used Excel to do a lot of um, data wrangling, um, a lot of reporting, whether it be daily reporting or weekly reporting. And th there's a lot of complexity and, and potential error prone, you know, prone to errors uh, in trying to, to manage big data sets. So we want, what we want to do is we want to, you know, through these, these, these five building boxes, is move people across into a, an automated space, you know, where they, they operate off a single source of the truth, you know, that, and when I talk about single source of truth, it, it's a data model that they actually really know and they trust and they want to use it every day. Uh, they've got automated reports that, that they, can, they can use from a, an operational perspective, but it, fundamentally what that does, it gives them more time to, to, to execute what those reports or what the performance of the business is, is saying. It's not, we're not spending time in, in wrangling uh, and, and less time in, in understanding what the data is. So that's what the real, you know, the real driver for us to, and, and the real business benefit. Um, <clears throat> so the bottom, uh, the model there is around, you know, single source of the truth. I can't stress that enough. Um, people need to need need to really trust what what's in that data model, whether it be, you know, pre-calculated metrics and and business logic in there that, that that's going to help them and stand there in good stead uh, in, in, from a daily and, and, and longer term perspective. Uh, you know, around 18 months ago, we, we, we moved to a, to a Power BI uh, premium instance. Uh, most recently, we've, we've now set up our second one in North America. So Mark, like Martin said, we've, we've got a place in Canada, Red Chris uh, Mining Operation. Uh, if we're going to be successful and get people to use data more effectively, we need to give them the best user experience. So, so um, working in conjunction with our, our Newcrest uh, infrastructure team, we've, we've now got a, a data centre in North America, and now we've got our North American tenant, and that's, um, you know, we, we want to put the data as close as possible to that, that site. The Power BI training program. So we've got a really, you know, we've got a great train, we've got a good program. Um, it's all around, centred around, you know, the different personas in the business and, and where they are in terms of their maturity with using Power BI and R. So if, you know, we've got, we've got programs that, that, you know, simply get them to use Power BI and understand that and be more effective, uh, right through to the super users, the guys that are, you know, deep in the, in the big data sets and things like that. Uh, the Power BI community is, is something we've worked really hard with. Um, we, have a, we have a power up session, we call it. So that's an opportunity for, for us to showcase uh, data, Power BI, uh, but we get people, um, you know, the experts in, the, in their fields and their functions that are, you know, the leaders in, in, in using Power BI, to get those guys to to show showcase some of the work that they've done, and, and that's been really successful for us, um, and it's been a great opportunity for them to, <coughs> excuse me, showcase what they've done to their management and and develop and their peers. Self service reporting, well, that's what we're trying to do. We're, we're trying to democratise the data, get it more openly used. Um, you know, if people have got decisions to be made. Um, they don't want to be reliant on that central model all the time. That 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 constricts people. Uh, so the the real benefit of self service reporting, they can answer their own questions. Uh, and the last one is around the working group forum. So it's something that's been quite successful for us is um, we've set up three type three functional area um, working groups. Uh, predominantly, what that does is is allows the you know, we have people right across the business from the from the group and all the sites. Um, you know, from from Canada through to Papua New Guinea and and Western Australia. So it's a good opportunity for those guys to 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 share information about what um, what reports they need, what data they need accessible uh, to be accessible in data models, and. Um, 
And just through that process, I think it makes them more familiar with with the IT processes, you know, working in an agile fashion, iterative way. Um, and I think that's that's also quite helpful. And um, one of our, I would say, success stories would be in the health and safety environment. Um, it's an area that was was really quite Excel driven. Um, we've got two really good applications that drive safety management in Newcrest. Uh, one is a leading indicator and one's a lagging indicator. And and to to do a have a holistic report on that, there's a lot of manipulation of data. So so through the Versa team um, and and through the working group forums, what we've done is we've been able to uh, combine that data model, but those two really good applications, we've combined it into one application and we've automated reports that now are used right across the business. Um, from a proactive nature, I think, um, you know, which, which is quite cool, is the fact that, you know, when you when you put a leading leading indicators and lagging indicators in, in together, you can see uh, with the with with you know the, the knowledge of the, the subject matter experts, the guys that are at the front line from a health and safety perspective, you can get to an environment where where you can see areas of rising risk. Um, so can we can we detect an incident happening? Uh, maybe. But more likely, we can see areas that we really need to focus on, where we need to divert our attention to keep our keep our people safe. So that was sort of the the broader program. Excuse me, I just have a quick drink. But um, I'd probably uh, I want to talk about. Um, uh, more of a deep dive in, in one of the, an example of a, a data model that we're, we're built at the moment. So it's focused on production. So our vision with this with this model was to um, was to have a you know an integrated solution that could could identify what are the key metrics across the business. So so what are the critical metrics that actually drive our operations? And when when we pull all of that apart and and we and we engage with the business, that there could be there could be key metrics that live on prem uh, in a mining application. Uh, there could be something in a, in a, in our cloud environment that's stored centrally. Um, but what we needed to do is put them in one platform so we can we can we can build off this single source of the truth. We we then can understand really well where we are in terms of our, our, our production performance and our, and our position against the market guidance. Step one around that was about identifying what the key metrics are. So, you know, engagement, I think Dirk, we've talked about it before, you, you can't engage enough with the business in this space. You've got to build, the, build that rapport with the team. Um, and we did that from a from a central perspective. You know, a lot of the leaders in mining and the leaders in geology and things like that, <coughs> excuse me, that we have in the business. So we identified what the key metrics are, who owns those metrics, where is it, where do they most prominently should or where should they reside? Um, what are the calculations that that underpin those metrics? Once we understood that, then we got the data engineers to work. So they got the, these guys, clever individuals, to get out there, map from them to all systems. Like I said, some of them are, some of them in the cloud, some of them are on prem, whatever. Um, but we've we've mapped a lot of those metrics back in, and then in a in a in an iterative way is is to then feed that back into the business and say, right, well, here's the metric, here's this key metric that you're talking about. You've told us how to calculate it. Here it is. Um, can you validate it? Um, and that's what we did. We, we, we continually operated in that fashion. And uh, and I'll show you another slide in a minute with um, with sort of the, I guess, the key metrics around that now. Step three really is um, where the rubber hits the road. You know, it's, we, we want one source of the truth and we want our enterprise reporting to be sitting on that. Uh, and accessing the same key metrics as what you would be in a self-service space. Um, 
So that's, you know, that's a, a really important point to make. I think, you know, a lot of times you can get caught up in conversations when we're talking about production and, and, and performance. And we don't really want to be in an environment where we're talking about is the data quality the problem, you know? Is, is the business logic right, you know? We, we want to set that up right back at the beginning in step one. So then we're not talking about that type of thing. We're talking about how we're going to drive drive performance, hit our market guidance and 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 above. Um, so that's um you know that 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 is a, a larger program of work that we've we've done. So this is our global view of the new press production model. Like I said, it's it's quite expansive and it and it's from a global we're a global company, so you know we it's um, we're mapping we're mapping from from all the all the sites. So you can see in in Canada we've got three source systems coming in from there, Western Australia, and then through you know into Cadia and the group, thirty seven source systems. Like I said, you know it it could be from a mining perspective, it could be a geology or a metallurgy reconciliation type application. They're all feed back into this model. So we've got 2,700 metrics in that model now. Um, are they all certified? No, but we're well down that path, and we, you know, that's what our that's what our goal is to is to to leave the business with a with a platform that um, that they can really know, trust, and um, really drive that performance. And and I and I'm confident that um, it'll be something. It'll be a you know, a true asset of the company, uh, this this production model. Um, just a little story, I think um, there, there's a, you know, in terms of, you know, people that are using this model and how do they have they found it and where, where the business value is. Um, and I don't think you'll mind talking to me, uh, you know, me talking about this, but uh, we've got a senior metallurgist in the company, he's been in the company a long time. Uh, very well respected. Um, you know, he, he was he was quite sceptical. He said to me once that, you know, what Power BI was going to do to him, he was very proficient in Excel, knew his data. And, um, you know, one of his his role is to is to present to our executive committee around what our performance in the metallurgy sector is. Um, he was open-minded enough to, to jump in there, attend one of our Power BI training sessions, um, with some support from our, you know, centre of excellence type model, is now building his own report. So he's now built his own monthly reconciliation report, which he then takes to the executive committee. And that's, you know, in his terms, he's saying that now I've got 12 days a year back because I don't have to do this anymore. It's it's automated. He trusts it. So that's sort of the, you know, to me that's a that's what this is all about. Um, and and it's it's quite important. You build it right. You build it from the right foundation. People use it. Um, it takes takes time. Um, just a, another little note, I, I guess. We're currently rolling this out to the business now. So so not everyone will use the new press production model, but a lot of people will. Um, so to try and sow the seed with these people, get them familiar with it. We've, we've set up some, a, a daily, uh, sorry, a, a one hour workshop. We've just we've just completed our our two our two one hourly sessions and um, and that was been very well um, received by the business. So I move along to the to the, my my final slide and um, really I don't, like I said I don't I don't think there's just a blueprint to deliver you know. The single source of the truth. We've, we've got to make sure that um, uh, you know that we're agile enough in terms of understanding the people uh, and and the different departments, etc. But I think I, I like this this image. Uh, I think it, it's held us in good stead. Uh, there's three elements to this. There's the people number one, the process. So you can't engage enough with the people. The process is, is understanding what are the business rules and standards that underpin it. And when I talk about the standards, that might be from a, 
from a time usage standard that we that we have in our business, how we how we record downtime, or it could be you know a mining material definition standard. So if we build that logic in and that data model, um, you know that's that's going to support us uh, and 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 keep the logic right. The technology is probably what Dougal was talking about before. You know, it's really about making sure that the platform's scalable. We're trying to build an asset that a lot of people are going to use. When people use things like that, uh, it, it puts more load on. It's about being able to scale it up so we can give them the best user experience they can get. Um, I think that's, um, yeah, and from a personal perspective, it's been quite a, you know, very challenging uh, but rewarding project to be a part of. Um, I'm really very fortunate to have a, a really talented and dedicated team that that are looking that, that are really engaged in, in in delivering this. And and when you see when you see the output or the outcome uh, when this when you get it right, um, you know, and you get to see how the business get to use it and feel more you know uh, proficient in using it, it's a, it's a really good outcome. And so I just want to leave it on that. On that note, and, uh, and to that point, I'd like to now hand over to Chris, Chris Benson. So Chris is the, the Director of uh, Data and Analytics and AI. AI. So um, over to you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brad. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, so can, we've heard from we've heard from Dougal uh, and 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 Newcrest um, on how the digital landscape is is changing and the democratization of data is very key uh, in these. But the success to being able to do that is to make sure that we've got that security, that ownership, the ways of working that we were talking about, that trusted data set. Um, within the enterprise, and one of the key t keys to that is how do we scale all of those components across the e enterprise when we've got things like uh, the the challenges around multiple legacy systems. You heard from Brad there where he talked about both, you know, on-prem and uh, cloud-based systems. These systems, you know, are uh, n not just on-prem, but they're in remote sites. Uh, sometimes with uh, physically um, um, difficult network latency issues, uh, having to use things like 3G and 4G on those uh, network sites. Um, and then obviously to, to, to take what you're building and the ability to scale that across the enterprise uh, and maintain governance and security and ownership while you're doing that. Uh, the last thing that you want to do is have the explosion of Excel all over again, uh, or, or access for that matter, because if Power BI is not governed correctly, that's essentially what can happen. So over the next few slides, I'll take you through what some of those approaches will, will look like. Looking at uh, approaching, you know, the approach to scale data over over the enterprise, the, the key is to gain trust, um, to, to get your users to, to gain trust in the data. And you heard Brad talk about, you know, that verified trusted data set. Um, how do you go about doing that? And uh, if I could go back to Brad's uh, slides, um, if you remember the building blocks of one to five and then the second slide one to three, it really comes into play there. Um, so the, the, the first thing that you need to be doing is transforming, you know, very manually intensive data and making sure that the data comes in in an automatic, consistent uh, uh, fashion. So and, and, and bringing that data into a single source of truth, really uh, utilizing um, features of Power BI service and premium uh, to validate and certify uh, data sets. And what we'll show you in a moment is how you can deploy 
your data sets and your visualizations across uh, the Power BI stack and the approach to that so that in the end you've got this enterprise uh, landscape for your for your workspaces. Um, making sure that data is consistent is, is, uh, is very key and um, making sure that the visualizations that users will uh, see on a daily basis are consistent across the enterprise is uh, very important as well. So in that you need to be making sure that you're creating templates, themes, that you're building a visualization guide that the experts in the organization that are going to be building reports, both your uh, reporting COE and the SMEs in the business are adhering to uh, the standards that you're putting out there. Uh, and if they don't adhere to those standards, well, then those reports just don't get into that enterprise space to be able to be uh, displayed to users. Um, and then obviously, once you've got, you know, a consistent uh, environment up and running, you're then able to implement additional things like self-service uh, uh, within there uh, and allowing users to eventually take what they're building uh, in the self-service, getting them into the hands of the reporting uh, COE team that can then take that into production. Uh, the next slide, uh, this slide here, will, uh, shows you how we can go about doing that. So essentially when you uh, create Power BI and you access into the uh, service, you may not have premium um, at that point, uh, but if you're just using the service in the meantime, typically that's uh, for, for most teams. If you want to scale beyond, you know, uh, the standard PR, Power BI service, it is uh, better to go then for Power BI Premium, which could be, um, which can expand beyond just, you know, a few hundred users to thousands of users, uh, depending on the Power BI instance that you choose. And the process really is that users will be able to create uh, reports in their own personal workspaces. Um, if, they re if they require access to a team workspace where teams can collaborate together and uh, build reports, that's not only uh, teams uh, within IT, but that's exactly what Brad was talking about. Your reporting COE or, or center of excellence consists of uh, report builders that are within the organized, uh, within IT and uh, users that are within the business environment. Um, they can collaborate together to be able to build reports that eventually will be published into a uh, into a Power BI premium workspace environment, which has some cert certain things attached to it that uh, makes sure that the reports and the data sets and data models that are going in there are certified and trusted. So, you know, um, your, your own personal workspace, you can do whatever you, you want on it. Within the Teams workspace, you have uh, uh, limited ability, but more ability than what you do in the enterprise workspace. And really the enterprise workspaces are just used for viewing uh, for viewing reports and all reports are developed outside of the enterprise workspace and eventually deployed into that. In order to get the reports into the enterprise workspace environment, they must go through a very strict deployment process where the reporting COE looks at uh, the reports looks at the data sets and looks at the uh, at the um, the information that's been uh, created and runs through. If you look on the left hand side there, runs through a number of deployment uh, requirements and principles to ensure that the reports adhere to those principles that that are required to go into that enterprise workspace. So you know the the reports must have a clear purpose, minimalistic design. Um, you heard, you heard Brad talk about measures, uh, definitions, and so on, and ownership. So definitions and calculations have clear ownership and uh, definitions to them. Um, we have, you know, themes and and templates that we use uh, consistently, so that we have clear headers and footers. Um, you know, we're using uh, proper naming standards and brand brand guidelines, and that 
you know, if you're going to be uh, reporting out to mobile devices or tablet devices that uh, you've created a proper um, reporting channel optimized report for that. So it's optimized for those uh, devices. Um, and so in, in this way, what you're ensuring is that by the time the reports come to the enterprise area, they are certified, trusted, and your users that are using those reports uh, will trust the data that is coming from them. And that's where your single source of truth really comes from in the end. And because we're using Power BI Premium, we are able to then scale this across the enterprise. If we look at how you, you know, manage hundreds of users uh, in terms of security, uh, typically, the, the, the way this would work would be you would take user, you would create an AD group, place the user into that AD group. The AD group is based on uh, typically uh, certain roles that that user would have. Um, they might have, you know, finance, HR, IT, engineering, um, operations, etc. Uh, once that user is placed into that AD group, group, we then take those groups and assign them to the workspace roles. One thing to note, though, is that there's no common role across all workspaces within Power BI. So if you create hundreds of workspaces, you need to manage uh, the roles, uh, the, the 80 groups into those, uh, each of those workspaces for those different roles, member, contributor, admin and viewer. Um, it can become quite difficult over time and uh, one of the things to do there is make sure that you've documented uh, the um, roles and responsibilities across the organizations, almost like a RASI uh, uh, document across there. If we look at the uh, approach to some of the uh, network latency, um, you know, uh, as I mentioned, some of the sites are really remote within the within the mining uh, industry and so uh, and they and they may have bad network latency in that case you could deploy power bi report server uh, down onto uh, on premise um, the, the difficulty just in managing that though is that uh, because the features are not the same as in Power BI service, you do need to possibly maintain two separate different code sets of reporting across that. Um, but at least it, it, it uh, reduces that network latency um, option. Um, you know, there's there's data gateways, and I'll speak about data gateways. You know, on-premise data gateways. Uh, obviously, when you put them as close to the uh, uh, consumers as possible, uh, that that would improve the performance as well. Um, host your your data sources closer to consumers. So one of the things that you could do is synchronize analysis services or uh, SQL replication, Oracle has its own replication and so on, so that you're moving data uh, closer towards, you know, the cloud where you're going to be reporting um, from. The other thing is to host the data sets and reports closer to uh, the geographical Azure region. And you heard Brad speak about this uh, a little bit earlier where uh, with Red Chris in uh, Canada, they've actually put a Power BI instance now, Power BI Premium instance uh, in, in Canada. And the reason for that um, is so that that is closer to uh, to the users as opposed to having it here in Australia where the network latency would be a lot, a lot worse. Um, and obviously there's a number of uh, query optimization and techniques that you can use to minimize traffic, but the, the four above are, are you know, uh, typically the best approach to it. Finally, uh, I just wanted a word around, you know, on-premise data gateways. We quite, quite often come across uh, that there's poor performance of, of the data gateways. Um, again, if you make sure that your data gateway um, is configured and placed in the same region, um, as your Power BI server or your analysis services uh, server, it'll give you a much better, uh, much better 
uh, performance. Also, uh, keep in mind that when you go across regions, um, you do pay for data exfiltration. So uh, it's always best to actually keep these data gateways in the same region as, as your analysis services or Power BI. Um, don't use the minimum hardware requirement. Quite often uh, what happens is uh, uh, we'll go in and, and, and talk to IT and say, hey, we need a, a server with uh, eight CPUs and, and 16 gigs of RAM, and they'll quite often just spin up four, four CPUs and four gigs of RAM or something. And unfortunately, the minimum requirement for uh, on-premise data gateway is um, it is eight CPUs and eight gigabytes of RAM, but I would say that you'd need to bump up the RAM on that as well. And finally, uh, implement high availability clusters um, and load balance across the, the, the on-premise data, data gateway. So uh, that's all built in. You just need to uh, essentially fire up another VM with the uh, gateway installed and you can join it to a availability set. And then that means that you can uh, push to traffic across both data gateways. You can actually uh, force one da data gateway to go for specific traffic and another one to do other traffic, but the typical example is just to share traffic across uh, both data gateways. So in wrap up, um, just, you know, what does the future look like for this? Uh, making sure that we're creating a, a, a governance framework to assist with the democratization of data assets. That was mentioned several times, you know, obviously that single source of truth. Deploying a robust and upgraded security model using Microsoft's um, uh, uh, information protection security labels. That's what MRP stands for there. Uh, if you've got, um, you know, an, e, an E5 uh, Office 365 license, the Microsoft information protection labels are really, really useful in, in terms of security around that. And finally, you know, uh, deploying real-time uh, management dashboards as well uh, can be really useful. So thank you very much. I will go on to the next slide. Thank you. Dougal, um, would you like to say some last words? And I believe there might be some Q&A that we might need to just go through as well. Okay. Um, thanks for that, Chris. Um, I think uh, the questions that have been submitted, I think we might run out of time, but um, but I want to thank everyone for attending today and especially want to um, thank Martin and Brad from Newcrest that provided such a an insightful and detailed kind of um, uh, insight into the story of how new crest mining have really unlocked the value of data. Um, you know, and you and you heard it. It's not just about you know some technology, and and it's about you know a platform, a single source of truth. You know, training and coaching programs of work, changing ways of working, really empowering that fully self-service analytics, and and creating change and, and shifting capability inside inside the business and you heard the sort of value that's being created uh, it was fantastic to hear chris's presentation on you know the under the waterline stuff that you actually need to have to be able to kind of get to the point where new crest is and i'm sure we could have talked just on that for another hour or so um, look I, I think that for everyone on the call if you're kind of in, in going down the path of power bi or you've got some data viz, but really it's not transforming the way the business is working and it's not unlocking the value, then um, you know, we'd love an opportunity to have a chat. Reach out to us at contactadversor.com.au. Uh, if you go to our website, you know, there's a number of accelerators. There's actually a Power BI accelerator there that you, know, you can uh, have a read through and there's a video there that talks a bit about what it can do for you and your company. But so I want to thank you all for attending today's session. Um, I hope you have a wonderful day, stay safe, and we look forward to hopefully speaking with you soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye.